okay it's a rainy miserable day outside it's the middle of the covid pandemic so what else to do but start another model okay so today we have the amt 1923 ford t roadster you can build this as stock or street rod but because the street rod looks really neat looks like you have a lot of fun with this gonna go with the street rod version um the parts are all here like i said for the stock version if you want to do that but before we dig into the parts let's just take a quick look at the instructions uh it's a simple kit so we just have a simple fold out instruction sheet depending which version you choose half of this you will not even use so you'll basically do stock or custom engine wheels stock or custom chassis stock or custom final assembly basically four steps pretty simple so here's a look at our parts we have our little body and you can see here already there are a lot of parts depending which way you go that you will not be using so even though there's not even a high part count to begin with you'll be even using even less so again nice simple kit should be uh, a lot of fun to build uh, especially doing the street rod because it can be a little more creative with paint schemes uh, things like that and it does have a nice racing engine in there so that should build up well uh, looking at the sprues you have your wagon wheels your spare if you decide to do the stock uh, body <clears throat> the fender assemblies will stay the same you have the parts for your racing engine racing wheels uh, differential suspension all come up in chrome for the racing version in the stock version they're all in the white plastic here's your stock old school ford engine here if you want to build the stock version you do get a nice set of uh, rubber bicycle tires for the stock for the racing version you get these really nice slits well they're not actually slits they do have a tread on them but they are printed on the sidewall which is a really great feature to have because it adds a lot to the final look of the kit without you having to put the effort in so i'm uh, going to get started painting even though box art is green uh, i'm thinking of going with an ivory body and blue metallic for the fenders i think that should be a nice offset brown interior uh, to suggest some leather and uh, take it from there so other optional equipment nice cup of tea 50 year old tablecloth in the background those are things you'll have to add in yourself <laughs> okay so gonna get started wash up these parts do some painting and come back and have a look when that is underway okay now just to give you an idea of what we'll actually be working with in the kit now that we've decided on which option we're going to do the street rod this is what's left of the parts of the kit and these are all the parts we will not be using now always save the extra parts there's a lot in here we got the bicycle tires we got wheels uh, the, the bicycle style wheels we have a 124th hood, the firewall, a complete old 4T engine build, the four cylinder flathead. Um, lots of good stuff in there. So always hold on to your spare parts. You never know when they might come in handy. Not necessarily for building a similar vehicle, but maybe something entirely different. You want to add something, you want to get creative. Always hold on to this. Now, the main thing I wanted to talk about. Um, Two things actually one being that this is an older kit that has been reissued there are uh, some flash issues with the parts so you can see some of it on here I already started cleaning up a little bit but you can see like for the pedal assembly here it's almost encased in flash uh, not really a, a tragedy by any means certainly uh, not something to detract from the kit but 
just as a note to say that when you go to build this, you will need to clean all of that up prior to build or pieces will not fit together well. So just something to point out. And of course now there are even less parts. So, But even with that reduced part count, we do have a lot of nice suspension elements. The engine is molded with a lot of nice detail in it. Uh, the Ford T of this era was not a complicated car to begin with, so the street rod being stripped down will be even less complicated, but uh, some of these details like the, the engine, the, the racing suspension, uh, street rod suspension, that will all uh, be, be readily visible, which is uh, one of the neat things about these. The second thing I wanted to talk about, a uh, little idiosyncrasy with the instructions, as simple as they are. Uh, when I started weaning the parts down to separate out what I won't be using from what I will be using, I just looked quickly at the instructions and assumed that these were part numbers and uh, realized they were not, which made me curious. So, when in doubt, read the instructions. <laughs> and they do tell you right up top that uh, the numbers next to the parts are actually the assembly order that you put them together. So, uh, the plus being that even though you have a lot of things going on in one step here, you just follow the numbers one, two, three, and assemble in that order. Uh, the downside being you will have to visually identify these parts on the sprues. So, good thing there's not a whole lot of parts uh, to deal with, so they'll be easy to locate, uh, especially if you've built a few car models, you, you'll spot these things you, you'll be able to pick them out pretty easily um, even for people who don't really know um, any of the things that really go under the hood of a car I think it, it's pretty obvious an oil pan or transmission pieces they, they identify uh, pretty readily uh, some things like the little alternator you might have to dig around a little bit to spot it but just something to note especially when you get into a final assembly step to make sure you follow the numbers for your assembly order okay so now I'll get started with some painting and uh, come back and have something that has a little color to it instead of just white styrene okay now here we are after basic painting is done and we have some color now instead of white plastic always a always a nice thing to see so I'm gonna go through a couple of things here piece by piece uh, so to speak uh, starting first we have our frame members I went with a regular uh, just a dark blue on those uh, because this is a street rod there's a variety of metallic uh, colors so they give some contrast I use some steel some uh, chrome paint chrome silver paint and actually went and put a dull coat on all the chrome that comes with the kit just to tone it down a little bit it's a little difficult to appreciate on the camera but you can see here is original chrome and here is the dull coat chrome just to bring it down a notch because uh, it's a lot of chrome and it's going to be a little overpowering I think on the finished model so hopefully that will look good when it's all done uh, you can see the basic color scheme for the body as I mentioned originally so we have an ivory with some brown accents and pretty happy with the way those came out then we have metallic blue to contrast the dark blue from the frame and I just went in and added some of the uh, step board detail uh, all of this fine lining that I did on here and on the step boards uh, simple uh, dry brush technique just used my good 3.0 not this one uh, it's hard to see on the camera so uh, I'm just gonna use this one in its place but dry brushed so put some paint on it took almost all the paint off came in almost at a right angle and just worked it on slowly patiently and you get those details to come out uh, as well as these body lines so 
for a small and relatively simple kit there is quite a bit there to bring out also did the same with the Ford insignia on the grill which is just about impossible to see on the webcam right now uh, for the floorboard this is a little experiment I tried this is uh, wood and it's molded with the wood grain so my thinking is always if I have a raised mold detail then I can paint it and bring out the detail so what I did I painted a just a simple base tan color and then I went back with this actual brush and uh, again with a little dry brush technique took almost all the dark brown off actually it's a uh, tester's rust color and came in almost at a right angle and with the dry brush just went across and it picked up all the raised grain detail molded in the plastic um, pretty happy with the way that came out you know, I am a amateur woodworker among my many other things I divide my not enough time into <laughs> so it, it was nice to to experiment with that and bring it out so certainly um, what's nice here if you, you have a kit like this and you want to experiment and you have something that's going to be hidden because eventually the tail of the body will cover all this up um, you get a little chance to experiment and see how something is going to work I think certainly looking at this you can see as I move forward it got better so at least I think so <laughs> um, now as far as the dashboard just went very simple I'll try to bring this in a little bit so, just painted the ivory body color, uh, the light tan to simulate like a wood inlay on the dashboard, and black dial faces, and then again, using that same dry brush technique with the silver and my fine hobby brush just coming across to pick out the rims of the dials and the needles inside. Um, for the canopy, just the same rust brown and went with some silver to pick up the rivets black to pick up the framing for the soft top and that's pretty much it so for all the painting that was done here and all the detail that could be brought out that i went for really just used one technique and that was that dry brush coming in at a right angle so gives you an opportunity to really make something out of uh, a very simple process so you, know, you don't have to go crazy with all sorts of exotic paints and airbrushes and all these things you can do quite a bit just knowing how to handle the brush and how paint behaves so always a good thing to keep in mind uh, later on I'll be going as I assemble going to do a little black wash to bring out some of the detail on the valve covers the air intakes uh, drive shaft things like that but Otherwise, as it is here, is pretty much the color it will be going together. So next thing we'll be assembling. Uh, I've test fitted some of the parts already. The instructions are a little vague as to how some of these things actually go together and more importantly, how they align. So uh, certainly something to play with if you're going to get into a kit like this. So I always say how important test fitting is, but uh, you know, in times like this, where it's not clear exactly where things line up, uh, really important, especially helping you to figure out where you need to paint and not. All right, so going to get to the assembly now. All right, so we're coming back into assembly to talk about a couple of things, namely problems with these uh, instructions, let's call them. <laughs> At this point, I think it's better just to call it an approximate guide to build your model. Um, and I'll explain why in a moment. Now, in the picture here, it seems like it's all pretty clear cut how the different uh, chassis elements go together. 
Mind you, these are individually molded pieces. Uh, both frame members had a slight warp to them. And to complicate things, there are no locator pins on any of these pieces. You just have to sight them in. So what I did and I included earlier just uh, a picture of uh, securing the frame to at least line up part of it. But it made this assembly for what is basically a very simple uh, box shaped frame rather uh, tricky. And the trick came in getting things properly aligned because of the absence of locator pins, notches, anything to, to guide you through where things actually locate. They had these very generalized indications of arrows where things should go, but uh, you, you have to sight it through. So let me just flip this over to talk about it a little bit more. Now when I built this, uh, one of the big problems I noticed was the location of the two engine mounts have to go inside the frame channels. There's no indication where they go. There are three openings where they could be positioned. And if you glue the motor mount in before you put the motor in and you pick the wrong location, you're not going to line up with your drive shaft and meet your differential. Or if you may hit the uh, front grill, which is going to be flush with the front here. So, I realized what I had to do was ignore the numbering order for assembly here, and I put the basic box of the frame together, and then I assembled the rear end. And then, once this was in, I was able to sight the proximate distance to where the motor mounts were going to be. I then went ahead and did the front end to make sure that I had everything square as best I could get it. And we'll flip back to the top. Then I went back and set this drive shaft and the motor in once again and did my final location for my motor mounts, which I then indicated with a marker. And I actually had to hog out an area of the frame where there was no molding for a slot. So, and then the last step, I took a piece of my handy dandy stock styrene uh, box. Uh, beam and just cut two small pieces to help shore up those mounts. And to give you an idea, so here's our drive shaft and here's our motor. So by fitting this together roughly, it sits in there. The motor mounts are here and here. I set that, well, held it there and then marked it off. So, uh, you know, part of my idea when talking about this kit was to say, hey, this is a nice simple kit for, you know, jumping in and, and getting used to doing things. However, um, it's actually proving itself to be uh, a, a little tricky. And for someone who's just starting doing these things, this may prove itself to be incredibly frustrating. Um, one of the things that was a big help, you notice I've added to my uh, assembly area a nice grid mat and this was a huge help in aligning the frame because you can use the lines as reference points obviously so what I did when I was trying to square the frame I have a nice bold line that runs through the width of the differential my other bold line I used as a site for drive line and that helped me center the front end and then looking at it from ground level, uh, my creaky knees, <laughs> um, gave me a look to see that my drive shafts were in line, parallel, and not askew. So this way the model will sit on all four tires, hopefully, when it's all done. So that remains to be seen. But uh, these issues with the instructions, now that I started uh, assembling, I realized as well in the final step again we have a lot of generalized arrows and I've already playing with some of the pieces realized the firewall doesn't really fit quite square so that would be a compromise fit between the body shell and the floor there are no pin locations for the shifter 
the steering column or the hand well the handbrake has the slot but these will have to be approximated um, better off before you start gluing all these things in because it's going to be very hard to reach in there and clear a spot for them once you have the body on the, the floor um, so and I'm wondering how these tailpipe assemblies are or these side pipe assemblies are actually going to work out so a little bit of a challenge uh, more than I had really anticipated uh, going into this build now I am building the street rod version so looking at the instructions for the stock chassis and the back here some of these issues are still present the, the box of the frame uh, the way the central leaf spring connects similar thing where you don't have a whole lot of location here to go by um, however not having assembled it you know I, I can't see for sure and likewise on the stock chassis assembly maybe these things go to, together a, a little bit more uh, precisely or with a little more guidance as to how they fit so we'll see how that goes but if you want a good lesson on frame construction and alignment 101 um, this is actually you know a, a good kit to, to work with it because it's a simple frame one two runners two cross members a transmission support it's basically three cross members and then the suspension elements it's not like you're building let's say like a dump truck where you have two huge frame frame rails and maybe 10 beams you know cross beams where everything has to line up but certainly a good practice session if you want to learn how to line up a frame use a grid mat if you don't have a grid mat you can use a piece of graph paper you can even use a ruler and a straight edge and you know right angle and and draw a grid but you'll need some kind of a reference grid reference to really do an alignment properly okay so now back to construction Okay, and here we go with the final build of the 1923 T Roadster from AMT. Bingo, and there we go. Okay, so a couple of things to uh, talk about here with this kit. Now, uh, the original intent with this build uh, was to show, you know, a simple kit, lower parts count, a simpler assembly for uh, you know people who are just starting with the hobby or getting back into the hobby and uh, you know as it played out obviously we went down a few different paths with this than I had anticipated so instead of that theme the end theme became uh, dealing with curveballs that you may encounter with a kit and in that regard I still think it's an excellent kit for learning even though there are some of those um, issues <laughs> that uh, ran into during the building, namely the uh, frame alignment, uh, the vagaries in the instructions, uh, you know, lack of parts location. So these, these are issues that on a larger kit could really be problematic if you've never, this is an important point, if you've never dealt with them before. Getting the chance to deal with them on something smaller and simpler will give you the experience to deal with that later if it should come up or you should be confronted with that. So, although there are some things that I could sit here and criticize about the kit, and, you know, I'm not really interested in, in knocking something here, but, um, you know, with, with every build that you do, you, you know, you, you get a kit, you have the kit open in front of you. Now, now it's time to make something of it. 
So uh, rather than just look at it as something that, you know, is, is bothersome or frustrating, there's a lot to learn when you uh, run into these uh, little adversities or surprises. So along those lines, and getting back to this kit in particular, uh, yes, while there were the issues with the frame alignment and the instructions or lack thereof, <laughs> uh, you know, it still builds up. It, it is a low parts count kit, so it's not difficult to uh, get it together. And, you know, once you go into it with that understanding, uh, rather than, you know, in this case, if you've watch this video, uh, you know, you're already aware of these things, but uh, if you go into the kit not aware of them, certainly you'll have to deal with that, but if you have the benefit of going into it being aware of those things, uh, obviously the build will go much simpler and, um, you know, you, you won't have any moments where you're, you're kind of scratching your head. So, now, what you see here in front of you is basically built out of the box, just building it as a street rod, except for two exceptions. The two minor modifications I did here. I've already shown some of the JPEGs for the ignition wires to add some uh, detail and, you know, visual snap to the engine. Uh, you will probably notice at this point these two wires extending from the windshield. Now, when you build the kit, the kit just comes, obviously, with the windshield. It sits flush on the body cowl, and it just has a seam line there that you're attaching. There are no pinouts, no locator pins, not even a slot or a ridge, anything like that. It just sits there, which obviously will uh, provide for a rather weak joint. And when I built it, I was kind of concerned that once I got it on there and got it straight, uh, I did want it vertical, like the actual Model T would have. You can build it with a bit of a rake if you want, uh, you know, to go with the sport race car type theme, street racer theme. But I wanted to go with the vertical, and I was concerned that with the fragility of that joint that this would just pop off the first time. Uh, somebody looked at it the wrong way. <laughs> so I came up with a, a rather simple solution that I thought also plays into the historical uh, aesthetic of the car, which is these two uh, guy wires. Now, the uh, Model T in its many uh, versions, iterations, whatever you want to call them, uh, it, it served as a little coupe like this. There were four-door versions. They were also truck versions. And I've seen at um, a couple of car shows uh, versions where, you know, obviously modified and some of them even uh, more stock where they had these guy wires to help reinforce the windshield. Now, I had that in mind and I thought, well, if I can cut two pieces of wire and put them in there, that'll kill two birds with one stone. I'll get that extra little detail and I'll get the support. And, uh, you know, it, it, it worked out well. It was a fairly simple, I won't even call it a modification. It was a fairly simple addition. I had some uh, stock wire, metal wire. I laid it up along the kit to get my basic length. I'll wait till it comes around here. I laid it up to get the basic length on the angle. I cut it. I used my uh, hand uh, drill, my, my pin vise drill to make two holes in the windshield. There is a gap under the fender, uh, the radiator cowl and the radiator itself. So that was a location point at the front. And then I used some epoxy that had uh, steel in it, which dries dark. So it looks like two, uh, you know, rubber mounting points, uh, gaskets, whatever, to, to seat that guide wire and its attachment uh, if it were, you know, a quote-unquote real vehicle. Um, so, yeah, and, and it went, and that was it. It was done, and that was a, a fairly quick job. I, you know, about 45 minutes, an hour or so, because I, I had to do some measuring and guesstimating and, you know, just trying to figure it out at first how I was going to, to do it, period. But it, it came out looking, I think, pretty good. So... 
looking at the car itself, you know, if, if you're interested in uh, street racers, and I think this is another big plus for the kit, um, if you build this street racer version, you know, this, this is such an uh, iconic historical, uh, you know, d design uh, motif from Detroit, you know, with, with the big curving fenders and the, the separate body and obviously this with the Model T, but this carried on into the 30s. And, you know, when you look at some of those those real icons of vehicle design, like, like the Duesenbirds and the Packards and some of the old Cadillacs, you know, th those cars are still remarkable to look at today. Um, you know, they were a little more advanced in that aesthetic than the Model T, but still, uh, I think this is, uh, you know, a really neat type of... Uh, body design to work with, especially since it's very easy to do the two tones, since your your body is a completely separate piece from the fender assembly. So, you know, it's, there's no masking or anything here. Normally, if you do a two tone, you got to mask the body and, and, and paint it. Uh, none of that here. You can just spray one color, spray the other as, as I did. And that was it, you know, so uh, it gives you really something neat to work with. If you, again, if you want to experiment with uh, two colors. Uh, again, being if you go with the uh, street racer version, you can use any colors you want. You know, the uh, if you go with the stock Model T, the color will be black and black on black on black. That's the way they were. Um, another little variation I did, I mounted the headlights higher up on the grill. I kind of like that, that bug eye look. Uh, traditionally, they are mounted a little bit lower, but again, at car shows, I have seen them mounted higher, and I decided to go with that look instead. Uh, as it comes around, there is something else I want to point out underneath. Now, here we have, after all the talk about the underbody, it all looks uh, like it came together without any issue and that's exactly the point I wanted to make here is if you plan out your problem solving let's call it uh, you you can make the things you have to do to make the model work disappear from sight now I'm going to stop the table here for a minute so I can point things out I mentioned before that I had to do some reinforcement of the frame. There's the uh, stock, square stock styrene to support the engine mounts. In addition, there is square stock between the frame and the fenders to give a better bonding surface there, since there was just a tiny little seam. There is some stock styrene at the rear to help support the uh, mono leaf. That's all there. I painted the bottom flat black. You'll always find that if you're doing modifications and you kind of need to disguise things, uh, flat black is basically the black hole of, <laughs> of detail. And uh, those things will just blend away. But if you plan it and you, you try to work with the crevices or the areas of the kit where you can hide things, then you can get those things done and they will not really be visible at all. Again, here, tucked away, are those additions to help support the monoleaf. In addition, I had to do a little work to get these pipes all sided up. But again, I, you know, working with the kit and looking at what you need to do. You know, here I figure, well, I know where I want the side pipes. So I mounted those first. Then I went and fiddled around with the pipe extensions to make sure that they fit from the engine to the side pipe because now I had two solid reference points. So, you know, the, these are the kinds of things that you can plan and with just a little bit of the aforementioned planning, you know, you, you get a finished product and someone looking at it will never know what you went through to get there. So, job well done. So I think that's all I have to say about this one. Uh, again, I would recommend this kit. Uh, there are great experiences for learning here that you can apply later on to more complex builds and certainly easier to overcome those things here and then apply those lessons later. So I will uh, stop 
uh, beating that dead horse. <laughs> and uh, yeah, call us to a close. So thanks for watching and hope you enjoyed it. And uh, there are a couple of uh, good things to learn here. So I hope that helps you out in your own builds. And uh, that's it for now. So until the next build, I will see you then. All right.